Think back to your time in high school. Do you remember that? You and all your peers, some older, some younger, but all together in this big hormonal soup of raging hormones, yeah? Do you remember that one spot in the cafeteria or on the benches outside where you always wanted to sit so that you could watch that one guy, that one girl? And perhaps the object of your obsession changed throughout the years, but always amidst all those other teens trying to hook up, make out, get lucky, perhaps sometimes getting unlucky when contracting some sexually transmitted infection along the way. Do you remember those horrifying pictures that your biology teacher showed you to warn you against those? Yeah. This scenario that I just sketched is something that many people are worried about. But research actually shows that getting lucky in the sense of getting sex is not top of mind for most teens. For most teens on a day-to-day -day basis, and for both boys and girls, um, they're not so much focused on sexual acts, but they're much more focused on the romantic aspects of sexuality. Things like finding someone attractive, falling in love, experiences with a boy or girlfriend. Yet, this, uh, so it's much more about crushes than about crotches. But these misperceptions are also visible in the media and in scientific research. Over the past years, increasing attention has been paid to this phenomenon of casual sex, which is having sex outside of the context of a romantic relationship. Everyone is doing it, some say. The reality, however, is different, because actually most young people have sex within the context of a romantic relationship. Three quarters of teens' first experiences with intercourse happen with a romantic partner. And young people also indicate that being in love and being in a dating relationship are actually important factors in their decision to have sex. Unfortunately, this reality is not being reflected enough in the scientific literature. I have been studying youth sexuality as a scientific researcher for 11 years. And I came to realize that most of our research has been aimed at investigating either romantic relationships or sexuality. So effectively, we've been placing sex outside of relationships. Isn't that odd? Yeah. In fact, it's problematic. Sex is by its very nature relational, something that we do with someone else. Masturbation aside, of course. Right now, we don't understand enough about young people's intimate experiences, who they're having them with, what type of relationship they have with them. And because we lack the scientific knowledge, we also don't pay enough attention to the relational sites of sex in education. The question that arises for me as a pedagogue and as a sociologist is how then do we expect young people to learn about sex in relationships? Closing this scientific gap is exactly what my team and I are working on. In my current research project, I collect data from young adult couples, men and women between 18 and 28 years old, and I follow them for a whole year to investigate how love, partnership, intimacy, and sexuality are interlinked and how these things develop together over time. I also examine how both partners reflect on these aspects of their relationship. Is their experience the same or different? And I assess how positive and negative aspects of their relationship are linked to their personal well-being. The title of my project is Lovely Sex or Sexy Love. This question seems ideal for bar talk, but behind these word combinations lie important scientific questions. Some of the central questions include to what extent do we see lovely sex? Are young people satisfied about the sex they are having because they have a good relationship? To what extent do we see sexy love? Are young people satisfied about their relationship because they're having good sex? So from good love to good sex or from good sex to good love? For this project, 
we have collected many hours of interview data from both partners in all the participating couples. We have asked them about their full relational sexual histories, all their previous intimate relationships, their chronological order, and how they reflect back on them. Our observations point at this. Love makes sex better. And yet, most of what we teach young people at home, in schools, is the technical stuff. Of course, this does not apply to all schools, all teachers, all parents, and countries differ too. But we still mostly teach about biology, and especially the reproductive system. We mostly teach about behaviors, and especially heterosexual intercourse. And we mostly teach about risks. Think back to those pictures of STIs in your biology class, and the warnings that went along with them. Use condoms! But sex isn't only about behavior, something that we do. Sexuality encompasses all of our thoughts, fantasies, norms and values, emotions, and evaluations about intimacy. These things are utterly understudied. We know too little about them. We must know more about how young people think and feel about sex for us to understand why they do what they do in the area of sex. So mostly BBR, biology, behaviors and risks. We don't teach them enough about the psychology of sexuality. We don't teach them enough about thoughts and emotions. And we don't teach them enough about pleasure. Also, we're treating young people like they're all having individual sex out there. We're not talking about their partners, their relationships, their shared sexual experiences. And yet, these are the things that young people indicate they want to learn more about. About flirting, how to make contact with someone you like, dating, being in a relationship. And these things are also really important for having safe sex. Telling youth to use a condom sometimes just isn't enough. Research shows that adolescents find it difficult when their partner doesn't want to use a condom, arguing that this is okay because of their growing trust and love. Here, relational aspects enter the equation. And to deal with such real situations, young people need quite complex interpersonal negotiation skills. But is that what we're teaching them? When we ask young people to evaluate what we call sexuality and relationships education in schools, this is what they say. They never really talked about sex. Like, the sperm goes up the fallopian tube, hits the egg. They don't care about that. All they do is talk about the dangers of sex and that, and nothing about the pleasure. They don't really go into the whole relationships thing, partly because I think they don't want us to have relationships. They didn't really help you with your sexual feelings. They just kind of made you feel bad about having them. Wouldn't it be grand if we could get closer to young people's actual information needs, more closely linked to their actual lived experiences, actual sexuality and relationships education? Learning about sexuality and relationships is so important, and for two reasons. One, these things are at the very core of being human. In many countries around the world, young people have had at least one intimate relationship or are married by the time they turn 18. And two, because being good at these things are crucial for our physical, mental and social well-being. And not just because when we learn to put a condom on a banana, we prevent STIs or unwanted pregnancies. There's a lot of scientific evidence showing that people in satisfactory intimate relationships are actually healthier. They live longer lives and they are more healthy throughout their lives. So good love and good sex make us healthier. But we aren't born with it. It doesn't just come to us. Just think about all those people who are truly unsatisfied, unhappy, or unhealthy in their relationship or in their sex life. Think about all the individuals and couples seeking counseling from relationship therapists and sexologists. 
Think about the numbers of couples separating, getting divorced. What does that tell us? Being able to maintain healthy and positive intimate relationships is something to learn. So what should we do better? One, talk about sex in relationships. Who are young people having sex with? What is the relationship that they have? How can love make safe sex more complicated? How can love make sex better? These things also need to be studied much, much more for us to understand them better. Two, start early. The building blocks for successful, lifelong, intimate relationships are being formed early in life, in our childhood, our adolescence, our young adulthood. Understanding these building blocks is what drives me as a researcher. Some people say that we shouldn't talk to youth about sex because it's personal. But most of the sex we have is interpersonal. And that's exactly why we should talk about it. We need skills for that. And even if you believe that having sex belongs to a certain age or to a certain type of relationship, like a marriage, even then, people aren't suddenly equipped with the knowledge and the skills that we need to have safe sexual pleasure. These are things to learn. So, one, talk about sex and relationships. Two, start early. And three, not only focus on the negative aspects, but also on the positive aspects. The World Health Organization says that sexual health isn't only about the absence of risks and negative outcomes, like STIs or unwanted pregnancy or partner violence, but also about the presence of positive aspects, things like partner support, sexual pleasure, so we should not only teach young people how to say no to the things they don't want. We also need to teach them how to say yes to the things they do want. Two sides of the coin. And finally, realizing altogether that better love and better sex relate to better well-being. So I believe that we should revise the phrase getting lucky. It's not just about sex. Let's embrace the view that being able to maintain intimate relationships with healthy and positive love and sex is what gets us actually lucky.